You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Mark, I have a stack order game. Terrific. Far away. I'm all ears. This is inspired by a chat with Richard Hawley this week, who's a great evangelist for kind of strange independent rock and roll from the 1950s. And as he was reeling through the things he was enthused by, I couldn't help thinking, you could make up a load of this stuff. Uh, and that sent me to a compilation album, which I think I bought from iTunes years ago, called Heavy Rockers of the 1950s, which is fantastic. It's got over 100 tracks. And it's got the obvious stuff like, you know, Bill Haley and Jerry Lee Lewis and Reeling Rocking by Chuck Berry. But it's also got a few that are strange enough to have been invented, okay? So I'm going to reel off. I've got in front of me seven tracks here, okay, from this album. Six of them are real, and one of them I've made up, okay? And you have to identify the one that's made up. Oh. Are you ready? Okay. Yep. The first one is Black Slacks by Joe Bennett and the Sparkle Tones. Black Slacks by Joe Bennett and the Sparkle Tones. Worried About You Baby by Maylon Humphreys. New Hound Dog by Frank Motley. Jammin' Granny by The Creepers. It Must Be Jelly Cause Jam Don't Shake Like That by Elvin Pelvin. What was after, what was after New Hound Dog? Jammin' Granny by The Creepers. It Must Be Jelly Cause Jam Don't Shake Like That by Elvin Pelvin. Knox Need Nelly from Knoxville by Bill Haley and Skinny Mini Shimmy by Latty Moore. Which one of those seven was invented by yours truly? That is fantastic. i oh, God. I'm absolutely... Uh, it, it must be jelly is a possible, I think. Jam and Granny, also... They're all possible, Dave. They're all, they all sound absolutely ludicrous. I don't think it's Black Slacks. I don't think it's worried about your baby because that's just, it doesn't sound like you've put any great effort into making that one up. <laughs> it's not New Hound Dog, definitely. I'm coming to round to think it's Jam and Granny. It, what was the, it must be Jelly. What was the other part of it? Because Jam don't shake like that. No, Elvin Pelvin. Elvin Pelvin. That's real, I'm saying. As is Skinny Mini Shimmy. It's Jam and Granny. That's the one you made up. I win, you're wrong. Because <laughs> the one I made up was it must be jelly because jam don't shake like that by Elvin Pelvin. Because Elvin Pelvin, as enthusiasts uh, for the Phil Silvers show, the Bill Coe show from the 1950s, will be aware that after Elvis entered the army, whenever that was, late 50s, um, the Phil Silvers show did an, an episode where their unit was joined by a rock and roll idol who was called Elvin God, Pelvin. this is coming back so. to me now. I've been massively fished in. As our old pal Danny Kelly, Kelly used to say, I'm literally on the riverbank doing, doing sit-ups. Doing sit-up on the bank. <laughs> I've been fished in. Absolutely. That is correct. brilliant. Yeah. Good work. So, so talking of lists, we didn't talk about this uh, last week or the week before or whatever. Rolling Stone, for whatever reason, have come up with the list of, what is it, 250? 250 of the Gu best guitarists ever. <laughs> I know. Already, uh, it's designed to get your goat. And, of course, it does, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> oh, it's, it's very, you know, I suppose this is the kind of thing that they've done in the past many times, haven't they? And it probably used to be a relatively simple business to do. You know, it would be kind of rearrange, I don't know, Jimmy Page, Jimi <laughs> Hendrix, Eric Clapton, yeah. Duane Ullman, a few others, you know. Uh, but now, because partly because the kind of world of popular music is way broader than it was when they would have done those things in the late 60s or the early 70s. Uh, but now it also has to, it has to reflect every interest group on the kind of political spectrum Absolutely. that hovers over popular music nowadays, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And um, and so you've got... So Mother Maybelline Carter may not have been in those original lists, you know, 20 years ago. I don't know. I'm damn sure she wasn't. And uh, as far as I can see, Eric Clapton's disappeared. He's been 
been no, he's there, there, but he's number no, 35. No, I was fascinated by that because I had a look at that. Mark Knopfler is number 96. Okay. And Eric Clapton was 35, which I thought was quite a good thing in some ways. And there's a little thing at the top. They, they say that uh, the list has um, rock, jazz, reggae, country, folk, blues, punk, metal, etc., etc. Congolese, rumba, flamenco. And uh, there are peerless virtuosos like Pat Metheny, Yvette Young, and Stevie Ray Vaughan. Uh, but primitives like Johnny Ramone and Poison Ivy are the cramps. And they say that they're, they're, they're more interested in risk takers and originators than technicians. But it's still so funny. The first thing I noticed was you think, what kind of a metric? I know, of course, I know you, these people are, you can't compare them. But what kind of a metric has Paul Simon at number 246 out of 250 <laughs> and Chrissy Hind, who I love and no disrespect to Chrissy Hind at number 172. But is Chrissy Hind, have, I, have you ever thought of her as a guitar player? I don't know, a guitarist. Well, I- if I was going to, I thought it was an interesting case, and I didn't go through the whole thing. You know, Chris, Chrissy, a fantastic artist, done wonderful singer, great songwriter. And, you know, but if you're going to have Chrissy Hines as a guitar player, surely you've got to have James Honeyman Scott, who played the guitar part. I would have thought so. On loads of those projects. I'm not sure right? how much guitar she plays. She was a sort of rhythm guitar. She's fantastic. Of course yeah. she is. Yeah. Kerry King of Slayer is at least 150 places. Above Paul Simon. I mean, another one is Django Reinhardt, number 70. Kevin oh, Shields of My Bloody Valentine, 67. That's great. Kevin Shields of My Bloody Valentine makes a very interesting noise. But the idea you could compare him with the, whatever he was, two-fingered jazz genius Django <laughs> Reinhardt is just impossible, isn't it? It is, really. And and there can't be anybody sitting there looking at the list of, list of 250 and thinking... I know all of those because there won't be anybody no, who no. knows all those. No, things. I didn't know. All you know, I know a fair funny. amount, but there's a yeah. ton of that stuff I'd never I heard of at all. Uh, I'm prepared to take your word for it, but you know, there'd be other people who know about the stuff that I don't know about, but won't know about the stuff that I do know about. So you know, the, those those things, those lists, kind of have to come from one consciousness, don't they? Really, or one yeah, they do. group of people uh, to make. And it some work. are inexplicable. Sorry, I just there were some that just tripped me up. Mick Taylor of the Rolling Stones at number fifty-five. It just seemed absolutely extraordinary. Mick Taylor, I can't off the top of my head think of, a, of anything Mick Taylor's played that I that I can. You know, I mean, it's great. But was he? Is he really in that? Humor Kraken of Wings is in there, reasonably high up. I Why mean, humor? <laughs> Humor Kraken, to be fair, I think, as a session man, was it Humor Kraken plays on all kinds of things. So I don't think it's just wing. So it's not just wing. I think yeah. I think he plays on uh, the Thrill Is Gone by BB King. If I'm oh right, right. okay. I right. think he's played on all kinds of things. Anyway, I was um, I was sufficiently moved to put together my own little personal list. Okay. And, uh, I have an offering too, but go on, give me yours. Oh, they, this is my my ten in reverse order. Uh, and should like, we say who their top ten is? Perhaps we should. I don't know. Oh, go on. Have you got it in front of you? I've got oh, down there. I've scribbled down there. Yeah, their top ten oh. was. Uh, where are we? Dwayne Allman ten, Jody Mitchell nine, BB King eight, Nile Rogers seven, Sister Rosetta Tharp six, Givo Jeff Beck five, Eddie Van Halen four, Jimmy Page three. Chuck Berry 2, Jimi Hendrix 1. So there we right. are. Right, right. Well, these are my 10. Go on. And it's like it, whenever I do lists like this, your greatest record ever made, favourite record or whatever, I could do them all again the following day and they wouldn't bear any resemblance at all. You know, I could reel off lists, no trouble at all. But this is mine, if you want to argue with them. Go on. Number 10, Pat Metheny. Okay. Number 9, Bo Diddley. Oh, Bo, good. you see, is Bo Diddley in that list? He must be in that list somewhere. He but. is in that list. I can't remember where, but yes, major pioneer. Particular sound. To sound Absolutely extraordinary sound. Architect of sound. Number eight, Hank Marvin, of course, who invented oh, yeah, the whole idea. The whole idea of the guitar hero yeah, goes yeah. back to Hank Marvin. That's where it started. Number seven, Jimmy Page, because you can't argue with those riffs. You simply can't. Number six, obviously, Ry Cooder. Number yeah. five, people may not know, but Larry Carlton, Larry Carlton, that kind of the, the person who's worshipped by all guitar bores around the world. Yeah. But you, you probably heard him on Steely Nan Records and Crusaders Records and records he's made on his, on his own. They're, they're incredibly elegant, uh, you know, jazzy sound. 
Uh, he's on Joni Mitchell's records, isn't he? I think he's on, um, he's on, what do you call it? Um, uh, the great Corn Spark and so forth. Uh, number four, I don't know where this comes to the Rolling Stone uh, list, but John Fay. John sure. Fay, I thought John Fay. Okay, John yeah. Fay, the great guitar primitive, whose who's, who's solo guitar records still stand up incredibly yeah. well. Number three, my personal favourite, Richard Thompson, obviously. Of course. Number two, Django Reinhardt. Got to be. You just listen to those Hot Club of France records. You've never heard They're anything phenomenal, like that. They're phenomenal, are they? And, they, you know, what are they, 70, 80 years old? Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, they, they sound as wonderful as they did. And the other one, just to kind of make a point, because here's a man who never at any point in his musical career sought to do the thing that most guitar heroes do, which is draw attention to themselves. That is, number one, Steve Cropper. Steve oh, Cropper, right, Booker good. T and the MGs and all those oh, very records. Good. And ended up playing with Neil Young in Finsbury Park yeah. about 20 years ago. Still around, wrote loads of great songs. You know, all those unbelievable guitar parts in the Sam and Dave records. Yes. Like you know, co-wrote sitting on the dock of the bay and just go and listen to those Booker T and the MGs records, you know, because the, that is arguably the greatest four piece band ever put together uh, with Al Jackson, the greatest drummer who ever drew breath and, uh, you know, Booker T and uh, Duck Dunn on bass and Steve Cropper on, on the guitars. So that's my list. Over those to those you. are great. Oh, well, my, see, I can't, I, as ever, I can't bear to think of just 10 without mentioning a few are just outside. So I wanted to mention, Glenn Campbell, who I love, Jerry Garcia, Anna Calvi, Jimmy Page, because of Since I've Been Loving You, uh, Bert Yanch, and Chuck Berry. But the top ten, I think, would be, I'm sorry, Jimi Hendrix, I still absolutely love, though. I know no, it's unoriginal. Okay. No. Love him. I, 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 I'm as excited listening to him now as I was when I first heard it. Unbelievable sense of freedom and space, and it's wonderful. Jeff Buckley, I think, very, very underrated. Oh, really? Underrated. Jeff wow. Buckley, phenomenal. His playing of his psychedelic adventures on Grace, otherworldly and experimental they're amazing Joni Mitchell I think is just absolutely staggering she's a whole new landscape for her songs those tunings she couldn't play certain chords because she had uh, polio when she was a kid and she just invented all those tunings which is just a, it's a, a whole nother world Davy Graham I'm sorry well, I, I was obsessed with him when I was a kid Davy Graham's do you know um, Folk Blues and Beyond you know yeah, his but, versions yeah, of yeah. My Babe and Ain't Nobody's Business you know Played as an acoustic trio, and they're just lovely. And those Middle Eastern flavours, and just uh, wonderful little quarter tones and jazz. He can't sing, to be honest. He's out of tune, but he's an amazing guitarist. <laughs> Jimmy Vaughan, the fabulous Thunderbird. I mean, just oh, really? wonderful. I think. I think he's absolutely. Mad. He's got that salty, really kind of scratchy, raw kind of flavour, which I think is immediately uh, recognisable. Mark Ribot, I think of who played on Rain Dogs and Real Gone. The, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Tom Waits records. He's fantastic, I think. A real textural sound, slightly kind of high life, slightly kind of Cuban. He's brilliant, I think. Bonnie Raitt, absolutely love. I've always loved Bonnie Raitt. Just it's complete. It's quite, it's quite narrow what she does. She does it brilliantly. And if you hear her slide guitar playing, you know it's her. Hubert Sumlin, who I think is, a, I'm a huge, oh, right. huge Howlin' Wolf fan. Howlin' Wolf. Sumlin. There's a track, there's a track, my absolute favourite of it is called Everybody's in the Mood. And Hubert Sumlin's playing on that is absolutely great. It just comes in with these wonky old, slightly jazz chords, really, really kind of uh, abrasive and raw. It's just, oh, he's wonderful, I think. My fa- This is a really corny thing to say, but my favourite guitar solo, possibly of all time, and therefore I must mention it, uh, is uh, I Put a Spell on You, the live version by Creedence Clearwater Revivals and John oh. Fogarty. It's absolutely unbelievable, I think. And my fave, I think, the most understated uh, and, and thus almost overlooked guitar player, Gillian Welsh as a solo act would have been just Gillian Welsh with a guitar, and she has Dave Rawlings, her, her husband, playing a second guitar, and it's so clever, the little embroideries that he puts in, all the little blue notes... And a little um, imaginative and really clever little little nuances, and I think I think he's astonishing actually. And he's completely kind of unflamboyant. He's the total opposite of your, your Jimi Hendrix or whatever. But he's just a phenomenal guitar. So I would go for him actually. As being, any particular order, I don't know. But that's that's what I was thinking of twenty minutes ago, and that's what I'm going with. 
So there you are. You can go and look at the whole 250 on the Rolling Stone website. They'll all be there. But if you want the right answer, you've just heard it. (laughs) The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. This word in your ear is brought to you in part uh, thanks to NordVPN. VPN stands for, Mark, what? Virtual Private Network. That's correct. It's a way of keeping your data safe on the internet, whether you're logging in either at home or abroad. VPN protects your identity and encrypts your data. Encrypts. Encrypts your data. Encrypts. So that nobody can steal your identity. And at the same time, it enables you to access the internet via servers in more than 50, count them, 50 different countries. That means you can often sidestep region restrictions and stream movies and TV programs from all around the world. Because the great truth about streaming is the film you want to see is usually streaming in another country. I tell you what I saw this week, tiny little thing that I saw this week. Um, in, in, in the light of the death of Bobby Charlton, I've been finding loads of old clips of Bobby Charlton. I think Bobby Charlton stopped playing for Manchester United in 1973. Did you see him play? I saw him play. No, never, uh, no. In, I loved in, him. The, wow. in, the early, in the early 70s. Anyway, he plays his last game for Man United at Chelsea. And it was decided that they would present him with uh, with something, you know, to mark the occasion. And so he turned up on the pitch. And you can find this clip. It's, it's on YouTube. There he is being presented with a silver cigarette box. <laughs> that's perfect. Oh, that's great. Exactly. Classic, you know. That's fantastic. A silver cigarette box. A, a, a 200 anybody? embassy to go with it. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, oh, that's fantastic. And a large bottle of scotch. That's superb, isn't it? Uh, what have you been watching, Mark? Well, we've been watching uh, Olive Kitteridge, which is the miniseries that's just come on on Sky. It actually was made about, I think it was made around 2014. And it's based on a book by Elizabeth Strout, and it's uh, and it stars Francis McDormand. And that's really why we're watching it, and I think it's fantastic. There's only four episodes; we've seen two of them. Um, she is just the most mesmerising actress. You cannot take your eyes off her. Every tiny wrinkle and of her face, every tiny tiny ghost of a facial expression, seems to indicate so much. And it's a kind of a gloomy old story. Um, with a brilliant opening about her husband, with whom, of course, she gets on very badly. She's utterly misanthropic and doesn't like anybody, really. And her husband falls, rather sort of becomes infatuated by the young girl who's working in the in the, in the chemist, the pharmacy with him. And uh, there's all sorts of strands to it, and it, but it's riveting. And I, I would recommend it. I love her. I, I can't think of anything I haven't seen that she's been in, actually. OK, I shall look out We're for it. So- Back to NordVPN, you can take advantage of a deal where you can try NordVPN by going to nordvpn.com slash your ear, or just use the code your ear to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and one additional month for free. And a bonus gift. It's risk-free because there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Full details in the show notes below. The Word Podcast. Two cocoa tins and a piece of string. So, Mark, we've got a leaked Radio 1 memo. We don't normally trade in media scuttlebutt, but we've got a leaked Radio uh, 1 memo. It's It's piping piping hot. Piping hot. It's absolutely (laughs) piping hot. I think empires may crumble. I think heads may roll. (laughs) I think reputations may may be skewered for eternity. And you will have heard it here first. It's it's unbelievably hard-hitting stuff, isn't it, Dave? I mean, it, when it leaks out that we've got this thing, there will be people quaking in their boots. The I mean, only slight problem, I suppose, the only slight fly in the ointment is it was, it was from 1982, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to in any way undermine its, uh, its, uh, its uh, uh, might and authority, but it's from 1982, it's from Derek Chinnery, wasn't it? He Derek- was the he was the controller of Radio 1 yeah. in those days and for many years. And um, and I've had this memo uh, since 1982. I think I was given it by somebody, and uh, it sat in the in the bottom of a drawer. And I just found it the other day. I thought, my God, it's still there. Actually, typed out 
Probably yeah. involving carbon paper, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? You know, it's Would really old-fashioned memo. Of course, it's for, it's from Dave, uh, Derek Chinnery, uh, reminding Radio One producers and more to the point DJs of the things that they are expected to do and the things they are not expected to do. Is that is that fair enough? Yeah, it is. I, I was trying to imagine the hollow laughter. It would have greeted this. <laughs> it was circulating those little cubicles where John Walters, you know, <laughs> John Fields' producer would have been howling with mirth. But, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Actually, it's funny because I read it. I thought a lot of it would be exactly the same now. But go on. Which I, I've, I've scribbled down a couple of bits I thought were Go on. Tell us. One was, uh, one was uh, it says, do not resort to common talk <laughs> in a pathetic attempt at humour. And that was just a good friend. Come to talk. My God. There, there was, uh, it says, listeners will expect the DJ to be knowledgeable and informed. Wait, uh, what? I what? thought was really good because I can I can remember doing stand in for standing in for radio one, but for, I don't know, Kid Jensen show and stuff like that. And following at one point DLT, and DLT used to arrive. And I mean, this is no secret. He used to arrive with his box of records. And in between each record was a piece of paper telling him pretty much giving him the information about who Tears for Fears were. You know, and who, who, uh, who orange juice? Uh, a little bit about them, and and uh, and where, what gigs they were playing in the near future. And occasionally, I think he might even possibly invent the notion that he had attended one of those gigs, where uh, I'm not entirely sure that he had. But anyway, there was a, a thing saying that uh, you're not allowed to brand naming of particular brands, obviously, which is still the same now. As it said, you can say, "I hope you're enjoying your cornflakes," but you can't say, "I hope you're enjoying your shredded wheat." That's interesting, isn't it? Because Cornflakes was not a brand name, funnily enough. No, no. Um, it said, one well, bit is, in reference to shows, films, or concerts is okay. But giving gratuitous praise or personal criticism or advising listeners to go or not to go is not. Which is, that, that is bizarre. But, but it's, not, it's not, it's sort of not bizarre at the time, but it's bizarre in retrospect. Because if there's one thing that Radio 1 DJs came to pride themselves upon uh, subsequently was the idea that they were always telling you to go to things. You've got to go and see your sense. They're yeah. amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're on to, This is Radio 1 in the years that followed. Started, you know, clearing the decks to spend a week hyping up some tour or some new release from yeah, yeah, Oasis yeah. or U2 yeah. or whatever. They were definitely trying to trying to guide the audience, weren't they? Whereas there was a, there was a time when, uh, you know, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't necessarily regarded as good, as a good thing. Um, no it, overplugging of personal appearances. <laughs> that, I, I'm not surprised. I can remember that so vividly. You always hear your Mike Reeds or whatever would, would sort of always sign off with, uh, thanks for listening. And, uh, you know, I'll see you in, uh, you know, uh, Moles Club in Bath uh, this evening at eight o'clock, you know. And uh, so they were just, uh, they were constant. They always plug in. I mean, that was half, half the point of getting someone to do those things is you could give it all that publicity, you know. Uh, there was another one about saying that you can, you can talk about articles in today's newspapers. You can't say which newspaper it is. Yes. Because if you were saying which newspaper it is, it would appear to be an endorsement of that newspaper. And that's therefore a kind of favoritism. Really interesting, don't you think? It is. And it shows, it, it points out the, the eternal truth. That uh, you know, back then, just as nowadays, you really wouldn't want to be in management at the BBC, would you? you know no, I mean? no, because you just get it in the neck, whatever it is. You know what I mean? Whether it's a serious issue or a trivial issue, you get it in the neck. You've always, you know, according to one segment of the audience, you've done the wrong thing. Now, nobody gives the controllers of Capital Radio or whatever that kind of grief at all. It doesn't occur to them. The no. BBC, if there's any absolute, any excuse for controversy, they get it in the neck. And I really wouldn't like to be in their shoes, you know, because um, there's Maybe nothing not now, you can because... say. There's nothing you can say at all. And also they're defending themselves nowadays on so many fronts. Whereas, you know, 1982, relatively few, you know what I mean? 1982, what are we talking about? Two, two TV stations, two yeah. BBC TV stations, and, uh, and what, four, uh, 
four four radio stations and and then local radio and that was your lot really there was no six music there was no five live there was no you know all that other stuff there was no i player you know all, all the other ways that um, that you can reach people nowadays and so it was relatively it was a relatively simple world uh, but anyway so there it is and um, it, it it's corking stuff it is and, you know let the, you sit, curl up in a chair and let the long winter evenings just fly by. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. One item from the mailbag, if we can call it that, comes from uh, Chuck Lonson in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, we were talking last week, I think it was last week, about um, singers who were good at talking in between songs and whether we regard it as a desirable thing to do or not. And he points out that uh, John Prine was one of the very best I've ever seen. And that's absolutely true, Chuck. John Prine was a masterful, almost like a almost like a stand-up comic, you know, but drier than that. And uh, he he could he could spin wonderful stories about his songs. And because his songs all had stories in them themselves. So it just really lent themselves to it. But um, if you ever hear a John Prine live album, and there, you know, there are a few, and they're all really good, he tells a story. He tells a wonderful story about um, how he got the idea for a song, and he's how he used to sit around the house with uh, his friend. Uh, oh God, what's the name of him? He used to write songs with. Name's gone. Anyway, he's a very, a very, um, very relaxed character. He used to be, he always leaned everywhere. And he was, he was known as the leaning man from Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and so he came in one day with an idea for a song. He'd got a newspaper cutting from the National Enquirer or something. And it said, just the headline said, the oldest baby in the world. And he thought, oh, we could write a song called The Oldest Baby in the World. Couldn't we just? And, That's you cute. know, it was all about men who didn't grow up, you know. And, uh, and so the wonderful song, uh, the wonderful song, The Oldest Baby in the World, came from that. So, yes, John Prime was a fantastic between songs talker. And it's Chuck also says, Chuck says he does. He did it one stage. He went on for forty minutes or something. He talked on stage for forty minutes, but it only played two songs. But that, now that's Lyle Lovett. He's talking about. I mean, that's Lyle Lovett. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He says earlier this year I saw Lyle Lovett with this small band. And Lyle does a lot of talking and storytelling, like a good Texan would. However, a cousin saw him more least recently with a large band, and although a great Lyle fan, he was turned off by the amount of time Lyle spent talking. He said at one point he looked at his watch and Lyle had been on stage for 40 minutes and had only played two songs. So maybe you can overdo it. You might it. feel a bit aggrieved. You might feel. Slightly. Angrily demanding a refund. I know. <laughs> but generally speaking, we're all in favour of uh, uh, people who can tell stories. Actually, uh, talking to people who can tell stories, we did our, um, our regular weekly quiz this week, which we do at the beginning of the weekend where this is for Patreon supporters. And if you happen to be one and you never joined us, you know, make a point of doing it. And uh, what we do is we have a mystery LP and we provide people with 10 clues, visual clues. Uh, towards it's very the good fun. There's people all over the world gathered. Yeah, they particular are. particular <laughs> time. It's a United so, Nations. I really people, love that people, element. People who've got nothing better to do on Friday night of Chuck Lawson, particularly. We were talking about him, Chuck Lawson. He's always there. He's the only person wearing a, a shirt and tie because he's actually a, a, a lawyer. And yeah, he's, it, he's nipped it, out of court in order to sit in his car. sitting in his car with his laptop, suddenly answering questions about, well, this one, in this case, Born to Run, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Born to Run. The answer was, that in this case, Born to Run uh, by Bruce Springsteen. A couple of things about this record that still kind of amaze me when I, whenever I contemplate it. Well, more than a couple of things, actually. Just what a kind of quantum leap it is from the previous two albums. Mm. <laughs> the previous two albums, kind of folky, troubadourish, you know what I mean? 
faintly apologetic, whereas Born to Run is a record that, that arrives with, with, if anything, a massively inflated sense of its own importance. And that kind of works for it, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, it, with a sound it, production that really, really echoes that, doesn't it? Well, he said, you know, at the time that when he was making it, it took him ages to make it, he said he wanted he wanted to sing like he wanted to something where he sang like Roy Orbison, wrote like Bob Dylan, and the record sounded like Phil Spector. Now that's that's pretty that's saying yourself a job, isn't it? Really, you yeah. know, that's, that's not going to be apologetic in any way, is it? Really, no. and uh, and that extends to the cover image, which of course is Bruce Springsteen and Clarence Clemens kind of leaning on each other. And I still can't get over this, that he had a band, and he had a band with, I don't know, about six or seven members, but he decided, no, the cover picture is going to be just me and the saxophone player. And wouldn't you love to be at the at the meeting where that was where that was was it discussed or was it simply not announced? discussed not discussed at all Couldn't he just did, he just decided he got the photographer he told Clarence to come along took the pictures and the pictures were absolutely fantastic and and then he decided no that's going to be the colour now that is that's balls of steel <laughs> to, t- to tell a band <laughs> sorry guys you're not on the cover Clarence is you know um, and it's but still amazing. No matter how much you must have disagreed with that, you you can't really complain too loudly. Can Absolutely, you? because not. your That's position in that particular lineup, which is let's be honest, must have been your life, would be somewhat uh, undermined. I would have thought. And, and so they would also, have had to go along with it. And also, if ever if ever there was a you know an album cover that the kind of music had to you know had to live up to. Yeah, yeah. That was the album cover, wasn't it? Really? It was. It was a declaration. The other, excuse me. The finally, the thing that still amazes me about it is that Born to Run, you know, the title track, was the absolute breakthrough. And the thing that makes it a breakthrough is the drumming right from the beginning. It starts with a clatter of drums, you know, pins. And the guy who played the drums on that, Ernest Boom Carter, that is the only Bruce Springsteen record he ever played on. He was in the group, but they were taking so long to do it, he had a family to keep. He had to go off and do something else. So Ernest Boom Carter, and there aren't many great drummers called Ernest, and sadly, um, that's the only Bruce Springsteen record he ever played on. But if you're going to pick one, that might be the one to pick. You're listening to The Word Podcast, where the time is whenever you want it to be. Uh, more correspondence, and we were talking about Radio 1 earlier, so this is perfect. But uh, Gavin Hogg, a uh, loyal patron and supporter of this, uh, of this uh, 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 podcast, wrote in about how he bought, he'd been in a shop and he bought a record, a blues record, a compilation by uh, a guy called Mike Raven. And we just started a correspondence talking about him. And Mike Raven's story is absolutely phenomenal. And if you look at Mike Raven's Wikipedia site, this is a guy who was, uh, he was there as a, as, a, as a Radio 1 DJ for about three or four years, I think, in 1967 when, when the station started. But the, the amazing guy looked like Vincent Price, born in 1924. And it made me think, has any other Radio 1 DJ ever been an actor, sculptor, television presenter, production manager, writer, sheep farmer, ballet dancer, photographer, and flamenco guitarist? I think probably not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, he was amazing. He was in the army. He was in the Royal uh, Ulster Rifles. And then he joined Ballet Rambert. This is just amazing. He then wrote a travel book called Another Spain. Very, very well received. He then started acting on uh, ITV dramas. He then <laughs> appeared on stage in various productions in Moscow, including one with John Gilgood. This is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> then he started doing stuff occasionally on Woman's Hour. Then, this is great. His cousin 
who was a Liberal Party politician called Oliver Smedley, started the bar at radio, radio station, Radio Atlanta, which he joined. He was doing a load of uh, blues things. And he really got the job because he had an enormous collection of blues records, which, of course, is fair enough, because had you not had a big collection of blues records, where were you going to get the records from that you were going to play? That's what you needed in those days. That was the tools of the trade. Smedley was then accused of causing the death of a rival radio entrepreneur, Reg Calvert, by shooting him with a shotgun. <laughs> This, why, Dave, why haven't they made a film of this guy's life? It's fantastic, it's, isn't it? I do remember Mike Raven. He had, um, he had an, an, he wasn't just an actor. He was an actor. You know what yeah. I mean? He, he had that kind of voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever you saw him, I think he was quite tall. Whenever you saw him, he was wearing a black polo neck, probably with a medallion around Yeah, the slight goatee. He had slight goatee. And you always felt that he ought to have a raven on his shoulder. He looked like a Bond villain. Absolutely amazing. And he, yeah. And he, uh, he eventually finished. He started working for Radio One at uh, in, um, I think it was yeah, 1967, doing this blues program. And he appeared in a Hammer horror film called Lost for Vampire. He lived in a 17th century pigsty in Cornwall. <laughs> I mean, it just gets better and better and better. And then, this is this is the kind of sad note, which also might make it even more valuable, actually, as a, as a, as a, as a documentary to be made. But he, 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 on the 25th anniversary of the start of Radio 1 in 1992, it was rumoured that he was dead. Then someone making some personal appearances had discovered that he had now gone back to his normal, his original name. He was living in, uh, uh, in, in Cornwall. And he said that his unsuccessful struggle to come to terms with my own sexuality and yeah. consequently my equally unsuccessful attempts to live up to my Christian beliefs made my life very difficult. To a very, very sad point, very poignant, actually. So there we are. I mean, what, an ex- what a guy, seriously. Mike Raven, it's a book, it's a movie. The Word Podcast, one of the few things you really need in life. Well, as regular listeners know, uh, any uh, any uh, Patreon uh, supporter uh, gets the chance for us to rifle through their record collection in its entirety for an hour. And uh, the next birthday uh, around, they get a chance to um, come in and toss a conversational log on the fire. And we're joined by uh, by Giles Fraser, loyal supporter of ours, who's uh, going to do that very thing. Giles, what is your what is your query that you would like to? What's got your goats, Giles? (laughs) Okay, so I I thought I thought this was a topic that's come up on and off, but I thought I'd raise it. I was looking at I got an email saying Eddie and the Hot Rods was going back on tour, (laughs) and uh, it it occurred to me I was a big fan of them in the seventies, but I think Barry Masters died. I don't think there's any original members around now. And they said, uh, well, the oldest, the longest serving member has been with them 20 years, which is obviously impressive, been with them more probably than the originals. But I just wonder what your thoughts were on bands going under the brand name with no original members, because I guess it happens more and more these days. But uh, you, I think you guys probably would be, you know, have a view on it. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm that bothered, really. Uh, I mean, there are lots of examples, aren't there, of the groups like Yes that are still going and got no original members in. But Yes... And Thin Lizzy is another one, but they had a kind of history of eternally changing uh, lineups. So uh, it probably doesn't really matter. There's no original members of the Holly. So no one explain all blood, sweat, and tears, or humble pie. They're all still going. My feeling is that if people, you know, if they really, they either don't know or they don't care. And if if they, if the group deliver, if younger versions of that original group, who are likely to deliver probably more impressively anyway do so, then I don't think it matters. I don't know. What do you think, Dave? And it's all, it's also interesting. I realised a few years ago I was in Golders Green and I was passed by a coach and on the side of the coach he said, on tour, the Glenn Miller Orchestra. Yeah, <laughs> thought, yeah, yeah. I thought, well, that won't have any original members at all, but they will no doubt dedicate themselves to providing as full a Glenn Miller orchestra experience as they possibly can. And that's fair enough, you know. So it's only, I think rock and roll is now going through the period that, I don't know, um, Sadler's Wells and Gilbert and Sullivan went through at the beginning of the 20th century when it ceased being a thing done by the original cast and, you know, with uh, Gilbert conducting and so forth. Um and it, it just passed into the repertoire and everybody does it, you know. 
and that that seems to be the the, the way it is. I was you, your query made me think of a neighbour of mine was the original member, the original drummer of the Love Affair of uh, Everlasting Love fame from 1968, 69, big hit, and. Uh, his, because his father paid for the band and their rehearsal space, he made sure he secured the name, in which in which he was very far sighted. Because one thing we've all discovered recently is the most valuable thing a band has is its name to trade under. And so uh, Morris, my neighbour, he occasionally goes on tour with a bunch of other musicians who do Everlasting Love and whatever else. And sometimes he's in the band and sometimes he's not in the band. Sometimes he just licenses the name to keep, you know, the Love Affair brand going out there, you know. And I think it's it's probably quite legitimate, you know. And if you're, if you're calling yourself Eddie and the Hot Rods, you're presumably delivering a slightly better experience than just another R&B band from Canvey Island or wherever you come from. There's a certain expectation in the name, isn't there? You yeah. Know, that, that they then kind of have to have to live up to, I suppose. That's what I think. What do um, you think? What do you think, Joel? Uh, I thought about it a lot, probably for more than I should have, actually, when I got other more important things to think about. But I think that, uh, I think on the whole, I think you have to get used to it, as you say. I think that, um, you know, generally fans, they're, they're very professional, they play all the songs you want. So they turn up on time and all that stuff. I think often they're a bit cheaper. Yeah. I think they often, to David's point, they have the brand. So you get all the sort of imagery that makes you comfortable. Um, and I suppose they can be a bit cheerier as well. I mean, I'm very struck. I went to see From the Jam a while ago. And the guy who does the Paul Weller role, I mean, he's not Paul Weller, obviously, but he's He's a very cheery man, and he, he very takes good. his all well role very seriously. So I think probably we have to, as you say, we have to get used to this as being a stage. And actually, to be honest, if you've had a couple of beers on a Friday night and you hear two hours of Eddie and the Hot Rods or Yes or whatever, then you're probably pretty happy because the alternative is not hearing it at all. Absolutely. And the, and the new members, it's interesting you're from the jam thing. He's not resentful at all, is he? Because he's not Paul Weller. <laughs> Whereas yeah. if your Paul Willow thinks I shouldn't be doing this, you'd be doing it under sufferance. You'd be miserable. <laughs> you you'd, be, you'd be making everybody's evening really, really miserable, <laughs> and but looking he, like you had said, no affection for the songs that, you were playing. Whereas these guys love those songs, and it's given them a livelihood. Precisely, and he says rightfully, I've been playing the Paul Weller role longer than Paul Weller himself. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. you know, I'm, I'm justified in taking this role. It's like. Chummy, who's, uh, you know, replaced Bill Wyman in the Rolling Stones, has been yeah. in the Rolling Stones longer than Bill Wyman was in the Rolling yeah. Stones, which is still yeah. absolutely amazing to me, to think of it, you know. And we still can't quite remember his name, which is terrible, really. Um, and no, Darling, no. <laughs> I, know, I think the right. interesting thing, the interesting thing will probably be in sort of 30 years' time, when someone like the Eagles comes back totally branded, totally new, but act, or whatever it is, 50 years younger, and a new generation say, yeah, I'm up for that, and maybe even pay the same dollars that their, you know, their ancestors paid for the Eagles, Eagles gigs paid now, you know, could be coming around again. They it, couldn't, it, there will, there'll be no uh, effort made on their part to then even feel they have to look like the Eagles. I mean, they could just look like anything they no. want to. It could be a completely new thing. It's just Honestly. you're playing that catalogue. Yeah, and you're playing them nicely, and in you know all the ones everyone wants to hear, and there's no oh we're going to go off piece and play something that no one's heard before. No, no that's, you stop. That's why I return to my point. Watch Gilbert and Sullivan. That's the yeah. key thing. That's the key okay. learning. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> there's a way, there's a way of doing Gilbert and Sullivan, which was established in the late nineteenth century, and it doesn't really change. And the same thing will apply to being the Eagles already in the horror. Yeah. Or whatever, or the Glen Middle of Rock. Right. Yeah. So we've so, got right. it all to look forward to. Yeah, all to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by The Word. 